All righty. I'm actually Nick Andre. Uh, Nathan's my, my partner, but I'll be speaking today. Um, this talk is called Heart Disease 101, uh, Resurrecting the Research. And we're going to do our best to provide kind of a straightforward overview of heart disease from the engineering perspective. So first, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Google. I have a master's in electrical engineering and a bachelor's in computer engineering from Tufts. I took advanced placement bio in high school, uh, and you could say I have an obsession with heart disease. So when most people curl up with Netflix, I curl up with The Natural History of Coronary Atherosclerosis by Konstantin Velikin. And on my recent trip to Hawaii, I actually brought uh, multiple texts on cardiovascular pathology, which elicited some fun comments from flight attendants. My partner, Nathan Owens, uh, is a systems engineer at Netflix and has the most impressive PubMed sleuthing skills of anyone I've ever worked with. He can send me a, a dozen papers a day while working full time, which is very impressive. We are here to provide an outsider's perspective on heart disease. Uh, we have no disclosures, though we do really like steak and bacon. And of course, I should mention our LDL levels. We are both lean mass hyper responders, which means our LDL goes way up on low carb, which was a pretty strong motivator to investigate this disease. My hope today is to provide you with a clear understanding of heart disease. Uh, the key observations that we need to explain about it and our hypothesis about what's going on. So on atherosclerosis, unfortunately, uh, we have bad news. The landscape in heart disease research is pretty bleak. The mainstream hypothesis cannot explain many crucial observations and calls each of them a paradox. It is pretty hard to sugarcoat this. The consequences of our failure to explain heart disease have been disastrous. Lacking good research in this area, our nutrition and public health recommendations have been led by fear-mongering based on paper-thin science. And this is not me talking. Let me quote Konstantin Velikin, a renowned pathologist uh, with over 300 published peer-reviewed articles on heart disease. No single etiologic agent and pathogenetic mechanism have been clearly implicated as yet in the onset of early lesions in human coronary arteries. Also, no useful result was reached during an entire century by continuing to put forward one theory to the exclusion of others. He refers, of course, to the cholesterol hypothesis. This is from Velikin's book, The Natural History of Coronary Atherosclerosis. Uh, which is the single most comprehensive and accurate book ever written on the topic, as best I can discern. I will be quoting it throughout this talk, uh, and I apologize, but I appear to have bought three of the four copies that exist on the internet, so that is the current MSRP on Amazon. Um, we simply need to do better. This topic is of paramount importance to every human alive today. Not only can understanding heart disease inform our nutritional decisions, but also heart disease remains one of the largest causes of premature death. So let's dig into heart disease. Um, this presents a clear dilemma. If indeed LDL is the devil and causes heart disease, why do I seem to be so healthy? Uh, Nathan and I asked ex-presidential physician Dr. Sean O'Mara for a full executive health evaluation, and he said we're in excellent health. This is a set of MRIs showing um, minimal visceral fat and negligible pericardial fat on both of us. I'm on the left here and Nathan on the right. For this diet heart hypothesis to be correct, there has to be a strong discordance in key health outcomes. So imagine this like a large balance. On one side, eating almost entirely meat has improved these things. And the only perceived problem is that my LDL goes up. So at the end of the day, this is an optimization problem, uh, not just from a heart disease perspective, but also from an overall health perspective. So LDL is what they call a risk factor for heart disease. Let's talk about risk factors for a moment. One of the most seemingly forgotten definitions in public health is risk factor. It actually means associated variable. So anytime you read the word risk factor, just replace it in the sentence. We tend to get very confused when we use the word risk factor. Specifically, we use it as if it means cause. Uh, we tend to apply what's called the pluricausal model of heart disease, which is the idea that many risk factors or associated variables cause heart disease magically together somehow. And just to be clear, the list of risk factors includes things like your zip code, right? Um, we're effectively trying to argue that weak correlation is cause. But there's no particular evidence in support of that idea. In, in fact, it sounds pretty questionable to me. In, in the real world, when you see a weak association, like bacon causes 13% more cancer, uh, or, or is associated with 13% more cancer, we cannot assume there is cause here. We assume these are tangentially associated via several degrees of separation. In this case, it's probably a weak proxy for affluence or healthy user bias. Uh, but here's the deal. 
Weak or sporadic association means no cause. If two things do not correlate well, there is no causal relationship. All of these statements like doing X will lead to risk, what does that mean? That's curious. I would love for some pathologist to show me what risk looks like under a microscope. Same with modifiable risk factor, modifiable associated variable. It's a manifestation that our approach to this problem is basically this, right? <laughs> we must remember that there's another possibility, that a yet-to-be-discovered cause drives multiple diseases, producing a correlation between them. It's called a confounder. Um, to clarify the current state of the art on understanding atherosclerosis, let's ask the National Institutes of Health. Oh, oh dear. Um, so first, this is mortifying, especially so to anyone who has ever avoided bacon in the name of preventing heart disease. But second, I'm very concerned because a lot of people claim to know what causes heart disease. And that, that means by the transitive property that a lot of people don't know what they're talking about. So let's start by defining the word atherosclerosis. What is the definition of heart disease? Does anyone know? That's actually a trick question. Um, and no, this isn't a joke. Atherosclerosis um, comes from Greek roots athero, meaning porridge, and sclerosis, meaning fibrous. So the word itself means fibrous porridge, which is a vague aesthetic description of this, what uh, arteries with fibrofatty lesions look like. I took this quote directly from the cardiovascular pathology textbook. The term atherosclerotic plaque is still much used but conveys little information. Um, the research at large is exceedingly laissez-faire in what we define as heart disease. Each researcher sort of picks whatever definition suits them at the time. So to illustrate this, Konstantin Velikin compiled 59 examples of different investigators choosing their own definitions. Um, I just have a few uh, takeaways that I took from reading through this list. Uh, many definitions stress proliferation, which means growth. So it is reasonable to regard atherosclerosis as a proliferative response to vascular injury and all later changes, such as accumulation of lipid, fibrin, et cetera, as a secondary event. Atherosclerosis is fundamentally a proliferative disease, a growth-based disease in its early stages, and atherosclerosis does not happen without abnormal growth. Um, atherosclerosis begins before cholesterol accumulates, yet this fundamental and critical component of the definition is often forgotten. You won't find it referenced on the NIH website on atherosclerosis, which I think is a little bit curious. Um, how many doctors in the room were taught that atherosclerosis begins without cholesterol? Um, many of the definitions stress that cholesterol cannot explain a large part of heart disease. And several definitions call out the immune response specifically. Uh, overall, I found these definitions to be pretty good. And for comparison, let's evaluate this definition. Uh, atherosclerosis can be defined as a disease process that occurs when the influx and deposition of cholesterol into the arterial wall exceed the egress of cholesterol from the arterial wall. Mahli, 1983. I call this uh, Kiko 2.0, cholesterol in, cholesterol out. Uh, <laughs> Besides being wrong, uh, this is about as enlightening as calories in, calories out was on uh, weight management. And there's also quite a bit of heterogeneity. Uh, Velikin said in a rare snarky comment in scientific literature, there is also no evidence that the value of innumerable meetings in atherosclerosis was in any way diminished by the absence of an adequate definition of the disease on which the discussions were focused. Um, the traditional theory uh, for a heart attack is called the hydraulic hypothesis, which is basically a tube getting clogged. Hired a world-renowned illustrator to do this for me, so just get ready. Uh, first, the lesion grows, uh, and then the lesion ruptures, triggering a clot, which clogs the artery, uh, and then the heart gets reduced blood flow and starts to become unhappy. Um, Reminder, this is not the uh, bacon grease in the cold drain pipe model where fat gloms onto the sides of the arteries. If that were the case, we would just use Drano. Um, the first step here is that the muscle cells in the middle of the artery switch phenotype and start to grow abnormally. Uh, this is step one. If you don't get this, you don't have heart disease. Normal muscles don't actually accumulate lipid or cholesterol. It requires this change to happen before li lipid and cholesterol start accumulating in the tissue. 
Um, this chart uh, illustrates the complexity of atherosclerosis and the different lesions it involves. We need to explain all of this. So for example, every early lesion, several early lesions like gelatinous and fibrous often lack lipid and cholesterol accumulation. How do we explain that? Uh, moreover, per, uh, per Velikin, when LDL, uh, LDL accumulation does not associate with atherosclerotic progression, and moreover, when it does accumulate, LDL and many other large macromolecules in the blood like fibrinogen do so in the same ratio. Uh, so the more I investigate, the more I am convinced that we are focusing on downstream effects myopically and trying to show how these are causal and ignoring the upstream cause. The uh, fatty streak is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the disease. Uh, these are an accumulation of lipid uh, near the surface of the artery. Uh, interestingly, this chart you were shown on Thursday acts as if they're kind of the first step in heart disease up at the top there. Um, well, that has actually never been confirmed. Velikin estimated, uh, he was a pathologist, he estimated that only 2% of mature lesions start as fatty streaks. So the graphic you are shown is uh, complete male bovine fecal matter, thanks to Ballerstadt. So Doc 1974 proposed the term xanthosclerosis to indicate that they're kind of a different phenomenon. He says it is high time pathologists, editors, and medical index rejected the errors of the 18th century. Um, stability of the plaque also seems to be of utmost importance to heart disease. The body is trying to fix the problem, and many of the processes in heart disease seem to act to heal and stabilize the plaque. These include things like uh, calcification and fibrous caps. So calcification is when the body forms a bone matrix-like structure around the artery wall. And fibrous caps are these little things that cover the, uh, the arterial lesion and act to stabilize the plaque and prevent it from rupturing. This is what's interesting. A stable plaque doesn't seem to cause problems, even if it blocks most or all of the artery. Evidence shows that heart attacks are driven by rupturing unstable plaque or a very acute event like that. Um, and it's, this is why using uh, an intervention like a stent to, uh, in a narrowed artery or basically propping the narrowed artery open doesn't actually improve mortality. And what this means, and this is key, is that atherosclerosis may not be solely responsible for a heart attack. Interestingly, uh, both of the following are possible. You can have a heart attack without very much atherosclerosis, and you can have a totally blocked coronary artery in an asymptomatic individual. So how does this make any sense? Um, under the hood, the heart can actually rely on what are called collaterals that effectively bypass a blockage, leaving no heart damage at all. This is uh, actually what it looks like when you inject a heart with a plastic solution and dissolve the tissue away. So there's a blockage there that's been essentially completely bypassed. Um, it's clear destabilization, therefore, is very important. Um, if the fibrous cap is weakened, this microscope slide actually shows the, a, a zoomed-in section of a fibrous cap, and all those little black dots are actually macrophages um, that have invaded that area. And this can erode or rupture, which triggers progression um, or a heart attack. Um, if we can keep this lesion stable, on the other hand, it can heal. Uh, this whole process appears to be associated with immune activation or an acute event like that. It, it turns out that we get a substantial increase in heart attacks in the, in the 15 days surrounding a respiratory infection. It's literally like a hazard ratio of 48. Uh, compare that to your cholesterol number of 1.2, right? So onto our hypothesis, it seems like immune factors are driving heart disease. In fact, immune Activation seems to play a role in most chronic disease, which would explain why a lot of these tend to be tightly associated. The problem from our perspective is that this immune activation has not been adequately explained. And we believe we found the answer to what's going on here, and they're called endotoxins. So endotoxins are little bits of bacteria. For time immemorial, multicellular organisms like us humans have been at war with these uh, evil little bacteria. Basically, we're kind of large, warm bags of nutrients, and Bacteria like to move on in and hang out, right? As you all know, we have a large amount of bacteria inside our digestive system, about 40 trillion of them, but the body sets up a firewall. Uh, if these bacteria get into the blood, the body goes into a panic mode and tries to murder them all, and this makes sense because bacterial infections can kill us. Um, the process of keying off little bits of bacteria is called the innate immune system. It doesn't need to be trained to recognize these things uh, our body has special receptors called toll-like receptors, which are just sitting there waiting for these bacteria to come so they can raise an alarm. 
Interestingly, endothelial cells on the inner surface of the artery wall also express these same innate immune receptors like TLR4 and TLR2. This makes perfect sense because these are the first cells that are going to be in contact with pathogens in the blood, and they would trigger an immune response um, when the blood interacted with the artery wall. Atherosclerosis occurs primarily and first in areas which experience turbulent blood flow, thus allowing increased interaction of blood components with the cells. So the hypothesis is that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease driven by immune response to blood endotoxemia. Specifically, that an incompatible diet results in these endotoxins being absorbed through a leaky gut into the blood. The blood endotoxemia triggers the chronic immune response via this innate immune system. And chronic immune response results in disease. One of the reasons I really like this hypothesis is because it has two different parts which we can separate. First, we can figure out what aspects of diet and lifestyle drive endotoxin absorption. And then we can figure out whether and how endotoxemia drives atherosclerosis. The latter point seems to be a bit easier. The more I research, the more data I find linking endotoxins to heart disease. Uh, there are a ton of these, so I'm going to go through them quickly. But we'll post the slides if you guys want to investigate each of these papers individually afterwards. So heart disease associates with dyslipidemia. If you inject these endotoxins into someone, they actually cause dyslipidemia. Um, if you inject them into a person, you get insulin resistance directly. So you can just cause it very simply. Uh, defects in this LDL receptor increase the event rates. It turns out that LDL is of uh, critical importance for clearing toxins from the blood. Uh, that's one of its job. Uh, Endotoxins also induce both uh, proliferation of the cells. They cause growth if you inject them and thickened intimas. They were actually able to cause uh, atheroma in rabbits by just injecting uh, endotoxins into certain places in the artery. I think this paper could probably be my whole talk. But. And blocking this pathway uh, via uh, either deletion of the TLR4 receptor or downstream signaling molecule like tumor necrosis factor will slow atherosclerotic progression. Um, and this, I think, is one of the craziest things. Statins seem to work through the innate immune system. So what this analysis did is they, they took a statin trial and divided people up depending upon which type of uh, variant of TLR4 they had, which was determined by mutations. So they did a genetic test. And it turns out, like, what do you think, uh, what determined how effective statins were in these people? Um, and it actually turns out that the two groups of people, statin had the same effect on LDL. But in people who were normal, they had a 6.6% absolute, uh, absolute risk reduction and a 36% relative risk reduction, whereas when they had this mutation, the uh, absolute risk reduction multiplied by over a factor of 4 to 27.6, and it had a 93% relative risk reduction in event rate. Um, so it looks like the primary mechanism of action of these is through TLR4. Um, there are also tons of different uh, drug associations. So drugs that block inflammation also seem to block heart disease. Arthritis meds, uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, TNF-alpha antibodies, immunosuppressant drugs like rapamycin and SSRIs. And all the uh, top cholesterol medications appear to uh, uh, affect the immune system as well. Uh, not only do such observations suggest that this pathway is central to heart disease, it also explains many more aspects of the disease than any other hypotheses, i.e., we have yet to find a paradox. We are thankfully not the first person to call it this hypothesis specifically, but there aren't very many people looking into it. Um, so, of course, the important part, how might we reduce our endotoxin absorption? Um, and to discuss that, we have to talk about what the link is between endotoxin and chronic disease. If you look at this digestive tract here, um, we have a big, happy family of tons and tons of bacteria having a grand old time. And there's one small layer of uh, brush border cells on the edge with a ton of immune cells right behind them. This is a, a stained slide of a, uh, a, I think, a mouse intestine. So we can use the following model to approach this system as a bit of a black box. If we put in the correct food, like this delicious bacon, we get a healthy digestive tract and low toxin absorption. If we put in the wrong food, like this bread, this results in an unhealthy and permeable digestive tract, and we get high toxin absorption when we digest our food. Um, so from this, we can kind of work backwards. If, we, if whatever we're doing results in low toxin absorption, low endotoxin absorption, it's good. And if whatever we're doing results in high endotoxin absorption, it's bad. And this model actually seems to hold quite well. Studies have shown that diabetics absorb lots more endotoxin than average Americans without diabetes, which are 
probably moderately unhealthy. And Nathan and I are working on experiments to compare endotoxin absorption between carnivores, normal individuals, and diabetics under the assumption that carnivore seems like a diet that's pretty devoid of food likely to cause intestinal problems. If I had to really go out on a limb, I would hypothesize that whole foods like plants and animals with evolutionary precedence result in a healthier digestive system and less endotoxins than processed garbage. Um, surprise, right? Eating a whole foods diet may help stop chronic disease. I think a lot of the improvement people see when switching to a keto or carnivore diet may be more directly caused by improvements in gut health uh, and improvements in blood endotoxemia, which then results in reduced insulin and all these other chronic diseases. Suffice it to say, though, that more research is going to be needed here. Um, it's my hope that we can move towards a world where we increase familiarity with heart disease to the point that we can dispose of these imprecisions that have led us to the current abysmal state. The more we are able to correct and or ignore people who lack a strong understanding of the fundamental pathology of atherosclerosis, the more we can stand to drive intelligent discourse and improve our overall understanding. Hopefully we can progress towards answers to these questions that have yet eluded us. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. I'd like to thank Nathan. He's been absolutely instrumental in the research, and I would definitely not be standing here before you knowing what I know if he hadn't been working with me. Uh, Thanks to Nadir for being crazy enough to invite me and all of you to, for continuing to quash the garbage science in public health and nutrition. If you'd like to know more, you can visit us online. We have a link up there, rootcausinghealth.com slash Houston, where we've posted the slides. And we are also uh, uh, accepting Patreon supporters so we can buy uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, ELISA assays. So thank you so much. So we have, uh, we have just a few more uh, transforma transformational stories that are amazing, especially the last one. You're not going to want to leave before that. So next up is...